Men spent a hundred years building this. Nature destroyed it in half an hour. Looking more like war than weather, the battle along here cost 16 lives and injured 550 people. It is now moving toward the north part of the city. If you live in the north part or on the northern edge, for God's sake, take cover. When you think of a classic American tornado horror story, there's a lot of examples that come to mind. But for me, and for many others, the 1966 Topeka, Kansas tornado and its iconic imagery is certainly among the most infamous. It's been almost 60 years since June 8th, 1966, and one of the most infamous tornadoes in American history, with 17 fatalities, over 500 injuries, and one billion dollars in damage. The 1966 Topeka, Kansas tornado has been solidified as one of the most horrifying and consequential tornadoes of the 20th century. Today, we explore a story filled with myth, terror, and discovery. This is the story of the 1966 Topeka, Kansas F5. It's the year 1966. Lyndon B. Johnson has been president for just under three years. The war in Vietnam was continuing its escalation. NASA's Project Gemini was completed after 10 manned launches. And remember, this is a decade and period in time that's not so far removed from World War II. In fact, national weather operations were reliant upon World War II technology. It was in the year 1942 that the U.S. Navy had donated 25 surplus radars to, at the time, what was the National Weather Bureau, marking the start of the United States weather radar system. So in the year 1966, this is the technology that's being used. Radar imagery was often fuzzy, and there was really no way at all to observe any mesoscale or smaller features from these radars like we can observe today. And as we know, without having those critical mesoscale features to analyze, understanding the fuller weather picture becomes a lot more difficult for forecasters. So in this context, in the year 1966, we understand that there's still a lot of scientific discovery to be made. And without the presence of science comes human nature, our propensity to create an explanation for something we maybe don't fully understand yet. And this is important not only for this story, but for other stories about tornadoes in the Great Plains that were still very much largely shrouded in old wives' tales and myths or Native American legends about tornadoes and what they are and are not able to do. So keep that in mind for this story. We're going to come back to it. So it's now with all of this in mind that we move to June 8th, 1966. June 8, 1966. An upper-level trough is crossing the Rockies headed eastward towards the Central Plains. Morning surface maps reflect the strong low-pressure system over the Oklahoma Panhandle as a warm front stationed over Oklahoma begins to extend into southern Kansas. By the early morning hours in the Central Plains, temperatures near this warm front reached the mid to low 80s, with temperatures just a few hundred miles north in the 40s across western Nebraska. 
Having the confidence that the environment would be more volatile and conducive to severe weather later on in the day, forecasters would issue a series of weather watches for Kansas, which did include the city of Topeka. In preparation for the anticipated severe weather, weather staff made a series of phone calls to alert law enforcement and civil defense officials to warn of the impending storms. The dedication to preparation that the public officials took and the dedication of the citizens to take them seriously is an entire story on its own, considering that 1966 isn't very far removed from a time when the word tornado was banned publicly on radio and when you consider the fact that there was significantly less accessibility to technological advancement at the time, the way that the citizens of Topeka worked together before, during, and after this event is nothing short of incredible and that's something you will see displayed throughout multiple points in this story. Just before 6 p.m. a special upper air sounding is taken. Photographs showed southwesterly low-level flow winds at 50 miles per hour at 5,000 feet above the ground, with west-southwesterly winds at 60 miles per hour at 20,000 feet. This is vertical wind shear, and this vertical wind profile is exactly what's favorable for not just tornadoes, but for stronger long-track tornadoes to form and thrive. In addition to the special sounding giving forecasters a better understanding of the volatile environment now rapidly taking shape, it would also be right around this time that a funnel cloud is spotted near the town of Manhattan. From this report, the local weather bureau noted that the storms were what they called a family situation, with several discrete supercells capable of producing tornadoes. Unfortunately, this initial supercell would eventually strike the town of Manhattan just after 5.45 p.m., injuring 60 people and would be indicative, once again, of just how primed and supportive this atmosphere was of violent storms. By 6 p.m., the upper level trough at 500 millibars was directly over the central plains. Storm relative helicity values at the time are just over 300 between the 0 to 1 kilometer range. Storm relative helicity is a measure of the magnitude of low level wind shear on photographs or a quantity that measures the potential for cyclonic updraft rotation in right moving supercells. And while it's only one parameter when looking at the entire picture of tornado genesis, it's an important factor in understanding the potential for tornado formation. By 6.45 p.m., another funnel cloud is spotted, only this time it's to the west of the town of Auburn, Kansas. Moments later, a weather service bulletin warns of thunderstorms quickly moving towards Topeka from the southwest. And although forecasters seeing this situation unfold know that the cell they're watching on radar is capable of producing a tornado, they're extremely limited to the information that they're able to gather from this type of radar. And this is where spotters become a critical part of this story. At 6.56 p.m., Topeka police officer David Hathaway is dispatched to Burnett's Mound as part of a weather watch to issue alerts in coordination with the local weather bureau. At the same time, Officer Hathaway is dispatched to Burnett's Mound. 21-year-old John Mindholt, a welder and member of the Volunteer Emergency Service Team, begins to see what appears to be a funnel cloud rapidly taking shape, getting closer to the ground as it approached his position on Burnett's Mound. It was only a few moments later as multiple spotter reports funnel in from Burnett's Mound and with new radar scans that come in, the meteorologists were absolutely positive. A tornado was now on the ground and headed directly towards the city of Topeka. Tornado warning siren sounded at 7.04 p.m. From this point forward, residents had just under 13 minutes before the tornado struck the heart of the city. It's just after 7 p.m. on June 8th. Tornado sirens fill the air in Topeka. Local network WIBW-TV interrupts the program Lost in Space with breaking news. A young Bill Curtis steps in front of the camera and delivers what would become some of the most iconic weather coverage 
in broadcast history. That's right. It's in this part of the city right now, 17th and Webster. Uh, at least one house was demolished there. It is now moving toward the north part of the city. If you live in the north part or on the northern edge, for God's sake, take cover. As Bill Curtis's warning is broadcast to the residents of Topeka, the Twister is now moving just southwest of the city and moving towards an area with a legend of its own, Burnett's Mound. Burnett's Mound was a Native American burial ground located just southwest of Topeka, Kansas, a burial ground that held a particular belief regarding tornadoes. The legend went that any twister that would approach the city of Topeka from the southwest would have its tail or its bottom half clipped off by this sacred burial mound. At the time, the mound was the highest point in Topeka, hence why you had so many officers and trained weather spotters going out to storm watch from this vantage point. The mound was originally named for a Potawatomi chief named Abram Burnett, who was believed to have been buried on the hill in 1870. And despite the fact that this Potawatomi chief's grave was actually found two miles to the west of Burnett's mound, it was still very much considered to be a sacred space by the Native American population. But what I find particularly interesting about the legend of Burnett's mound isn't just the myth, it's the history behind it. Five years before what would ultimately be the Topeka tornado, this very sacred burial mound was actually covered and many would say disrespected by the city when a water tank had been built on top of it. So while some might argue that the legend of Burnett's mound would have never held true, that the mound would have never protected the city of Topeka to begin with, those who believe in Native American legend might say that the tornado was retribution for the disrespect of such a sacred space. One of the officers gives his last report to police while on Burnett's mound, saying the tornado was now beginning to pass the mound and was headed now for the apartments and houses on Southwest 29th and Gage. It would be here just as the twister enters the more populous areas of Topeka, that it would grow in size and in intensity. The twister would carve between a four to eight block section through the center of Topeka. The twister begins to cause immense destruction as it moves across Gage Boulevard towards 29th Street. Not only were these areas incredibly populated with homes and apartment buildings, it was the center of town with dozens of businesses now being laid to waste. And it would also be here, beginning on 29th Street, that Washburn University would take a direct hit from the now violent Topeka tornado. There was no building on the Washburn University campus that was left untouched. Many of the buildings were heavily damaged, with several being deemed a total loss. It was within the city that nearly 800 homes were completely destroyed, with another 3,000 having sustained some sort of damage, as the Twister is just over half a mile in width. And it was only one block away from 29th Street. Directly after crossing over the Washburn University campus, the State House in the downtown center also takes a hit. And while it wasn't at the center of damage, the large majority of the damage that came from the State Building was from the immense amount of debris coming from other buildings. Seven twenty-four p.m. Washburn University has just taken a direct hit from the violent twister. As the powerful storm continues its northeast trajectory, it's in this very moment that the clock in the Topeka Daily Capital newsroom stops. The tornado has just moved past the buildings at Southeast 6th and Jefferson Streets, knocking out the power. Fully aware of how powerful this storm is now at this point, the forecasters and employees of the local weather bureau office are at the mercy of this storm that is now barreling towards them. Be it luck, fate, or some kind of small mercy, it was at this point that the twister at 7.29 p.m. now begins to weaken substantially, almost as if the entirety of all of its strength and energy were used up at the heart 
of Topeka. And finally, after carving a 22 mile path at nearly half a mile wide through the heart of the city of Topeka, the twister moves across the Kansas River and as soon as it appeared, dissipates. In the hours after the storm, all of the hospitals within the Topeka area opened their doors to aid the injured. Staff rolled their patients into the hallways during the storm. Babies from the nursery were relocated to the basement and healthcare workers raced to provide any help that they could. There is one photo that I think does a good job at encapsulating the sort of chaos and confusion of the aftermath. And that is the photo of mud caked Rick Douglas. It was in the hours after the storm that injured began to pour into various hospitals around the city. Two of the injured that entered the hospital included Rin radio stations Rick Douglas and Officer Kingman. It was Officer Kingman who found Douglas immediately after the tornado. It was said that Douglas, who was a larger, more rotund man, looked at Officer Kingman, who was quite thin, and said, oh, hell, you'll never get me out of here. The two would eventually enter the hospital together where a Topeka Capital journalist snapped the photo of Douglas and Kingman. In the picture, it's noted that it seems that Kingman is assisting the injured radio reporter but in truth, Kingman recalls, my hand was really just trapped under his arm. He was walking under his own power and Douglas was just dragging me along with him. And what's interesting about this story and the photo is where Douglas decided to take shelter. And that was under an overpass along Southwest 29th and Gage. Douglas was slammed into a bridge piling and dragged for a hundred yards. His car sailed a half mile through the air wound up in the basement of an apartment building. I can't even begin to imagine looking at how he must have been positioned with his head and neck exposed to the storm. But again, it's another reminder that overpasses are not and have never been the right place to shelter during a twister. Although I'm confident he must have thought it was the best place to be at the time. In the area near 29th and Gage in South Topeka, destruction at its utmost. Cars overturned, houses completely smashed to many thousands of pieces. The injury toll at this time is anybody's estimate. In total, the twister caused around $200 million worth of damage in the year 1966 which when adjusted for inflation is just over $1 billion in damage today, ranking it as one of the costliest tornadoes in American history, rivaling the likes of 2013 Moore and the Joplin tornado of 2011. The twister was estimated to have had a forward speed of between 30 and 35 miles per hour with a wind speed estimate given at the time of 300 miles per hour. And we know now that the science in 1966 was not as accurate as it would be today. So of course we're going to take that 300 miles per hour with a very large grain of salt. In total, 17 people would lose their life in the Topeka storm with another 500 injuries. 17 is not a small number of fatalities for a tornado. It's quite a lot. We talk about so many different roles that play into fatalities when we talk about tornado statistics. We have to consider the fact that this was a violent twister, that this was in a largely and densely populated area. We also have to consider the fact that this was 1966 and the ability to receive warnings via cell phone or social media were non-existent. And as always, I every in every single video I make a point to discuss the injuries that are a spectrum. I think it's easy to overlook injuries when you talk about fatalities, but the injuries truly in their own right can be losses on their own. It could be a loss of work, a loss of confidence, a loss of a limb. It can be uh, a loss of ability in so many different ways. They are still very much life altering and I want to make a point to discuss that. In the following days after the storm, soldiers and airmen who were guarding the city from looters gave way to thousands of volunteers from the American Red Cross, the Mennonite Church, 
Boy Scouts of America and other organizations who poured in to help the residents of Topeka. It was in the following days as Mayor Wright held a meeting with the American Red Cross, Salvation Army, and other local agencies to begin help coordinating relief efforts that the meeting was suddenly interrupted by a phone call to Mr. Wright from then President Lyndon Johnson. President Johnson said he was sorry and sorrowful for what was happening in Topeka and vowed his help. Mayor Wright told the president he didn't understand how a Republican in Kansas could receive a Democrat in Washington's sympathy. President Johnson responded, quote, Mr. Mayor, in tragedy, politics don't count. And the tone that's about to be set is something that really stands out about Topeka. There was a tone and an attitude towards recovery that was set from the very beginning. One that resonated loudly through the city. And that was that the people of the city weren't going to let anything, including a violent tornado, deter them from what needed to be done. In the coming weeks, President Johnson made good on his word and declared the city a disaster area as promised, allowing for federal aid to be brought into the city. This included federal aid for the small businesses, for those who lost incomes, and to help rebuild Washburn University, in addition to supplying mobile classrooms so that the students could resume class. Volunteers came from across the country to help. Repairmen, contractors, small businesses, and even the Better Business Bureau of Northeast Kansas, who was thankfully able to set up to help protect the vulnerable citizens from scams. I was tussling to keep him going in the basement, and he <laughs> ran, the yeah, and he ran down the steps back us and drug me in the basement and pushed me against the wall, and he laid down beside of me. And you were hurt and, some. Oh yeah, I was hurt, you know, not no bone broke, but just badly bruised. And so when he got up, he says, Miss Miller, Miss Miller says, get up, let's get out of here. I could hear him, but I couldn't speak. And when he ran back down and caught my arm and pulled me up, and then I began to breathe, I went to saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, I thank you, Lord. Three months after the disaster, the city of Topeka slowly but surely began to rebuild. Buildings that sustained heavy enough damage through the heart of the city were bulldozed, Portable buildings served many purposes surrounding businesses, allowing for students to use them as classrooms and for residents to use them as temporary homes. Small and larger businesses were beginning to rebuild back, many of which were built back better than before. The result of the Better Business Bureau moving into the area just after the twister was that many businesses established themselves with the Better Business Bureau and Topeka became a much more reliable and trustworthy place for the residents of Kansas to do their business. Unfortunately, this wasn't the first time and certainly wouldn't be the last time that looting and scams and various crimes were happening around and to the vulnerable citizens who have just lost everything in a twister. I debated on whether or not I wanted to talk about the rating of this tornado because as we know in the year 1966 the Fujita scale is yet to have been created and implemented. However, of course it was retrospectively given an F5 rating by Dr. Ted Fujita and other scientists. What's so unique about the story of the rating of the Topeka, Kansas tornado was the fact that it was extremely well photographed and documented. And part of that is thanks to the work of a man named Mike Warswick. Mike Warswick played a major role in helping ultimately rate this tornado unbeknownst to him at the time. Warswick was only 20 years old when the twister struck and was contacted by someone at Washburn University to document the damage originally for the purpose of insurance. Warswick kept a detailed portfolio of damaged photographs from the storm that included the crumpled cars and strong structures that had been heavily damaged. His work was one of several elements that helped Dr. Ted Fujita eventually arrive at the F5 rating that the twister garnered, which I think is completely fair. By this point, a couple years later, it was estimated that the wind speeds to cause this amount of damage were estimated around 250 miles per hour. Again, I think we should take that with a grain of salt.
Within several years, the city of Topeka was largely rebuilt. This included Washburn University, which cost around $10 million to rebuild the five major buildings that were completely lost. Public service officials and volunteers were honored and rewarded for their selfless acts during the tornado, including John Meinholt, his efforts of which absolutely did not go unnoticed. He was honored by the Fraternal Order of Police Board of Directors for, quote, service above and beyond the call of duty, despite great personal danger. It was volunteers like himself, the many police officers and the workers and forecasters of the local weather bureau office that truly made such a difference. When you think about the amount of spotters and public officials that came together and served their community during the time that it mattered most, it is really awe-inspiring and it deserved to be recognized and it was. There were many survivors who came out later to discuss the fact that had they not been warned by a public official or by the tornado sirens in the exact moment that they were, they wouldn't have had time to get to shelter and may have been gravely injured or even lost their lives based on where they were in the tornado damage path. Bill Curtis, of course, went on to have an absolutely legendary career of which was really propelled by and sort of began with the events of the night of June 8th, 1966. On the one year anniversary of the Topeka Twister, a 38-foot cross was erected in the Topeka Cemetery as a memorial to the victims of the Twister. The large steel cross has a concrete base. The inscription on the memorial reads, quote, This memorial is given as a tribute for those who worked unselfishly in restoring our city to normalcy, and as a memorial to those who lost their lives in the tornado of June 8, 1966. There is really no other story like the 1966 Topeka, Kansas Twister. It is the pinnacle of the classic American tornado horror story for so many reasons. It's an event and a scar that the citizens of Topeka and the city itself will always carry with it. Part of the reason the story of the 1966 Topeka tornado is so incredible is because of the improvements that we can see that have taken place since its occurrence. It would only be a few years later in 1972 that a direct audio broadcast line was established in Topeka to improve communications. In the next decade, computers replaced teletype communications, and by 1995, Doppler radar was first commissioned. By the year 2001, digital grid forecasts were added, and in 2006, the National Weather Service, as it then became, implemented an internet-based chat system linking emergency management and media. When you think about how far we've come from the year 1966, where small-scale features were essentially invisible to forecasters, to now us routinely being able to scrutinize atmospheric evidence and clues, it's hard not to be just in awe of how far we've come. I think that's all I have for today. I know I look different from beginning to end. I had to refilm this whole video. So I hope it's not too jarring. I hope the microphone difference isn't too jarring. That was what happened. The microphone got messed up, so please forgive me. I am so thankful for all of you. I say it every time and that's because I mean it every time. I'm glad I got through this through the giggles. I had the giggles quite a bit today. If you liked the video, I would ask that you like it or subscribe or comment. Just let me know what you think. Follow me on social media if you want. I'll insert clips of Blaze to send us off. Yeah, that's it. I will see you guys next time. Bye.
for whether surveillance, if I say surveillance, people will get triggered. <laughs> Be more vol- volatile. Volatile. And you think about the kind of work he did when tornado sirens, sirens. And you think about the kind of work that he did when tornado sirens, sirens. <laughs> what is sirens? And you think about the kind of. <laughs> in a time where tornado sirens, the pathway in my brain has been established. I'll never see it normal again. <laughs> and you think about it. <laughs> And you think about the kind of scientific discovery that he did. <laughs> oh God, God, please move on. And you think about the kind of scientific discovery that he did in a time where tornado science was still very much in its infancy. 